Hi, everyone. Today's episode is sure to blow your socks off. I have three stories that reveal fascinating information. Information that will make you wonder if the things you know are really true. You might even reconsider everything you've ever learned. But first, please snuggle up and pull your socks up tight, then get to know that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. I've tried bringing it up before, but it felt too weird. I'm from Colorado. I was born and raised here, mostly around Denver. I never felt comfortable in the city, though, so I moved up towards the mountains when I got out of college. I got my civil engineering degree at CU Boulder. Boulder has a reputation for some pretty hippie types, but I was never one of those. I enjoyed my time there, but on the weekends when everybody was partying, I would head for the hills with my tent. I got to know some good, out-of-the-way spots. So because of that, I'm used to the critters that are around in the mountains. There's always deer and elk poking around the campsite looking for leftovers. The squirrels and chipmunks are maniacs. If you ever feed them, they'll never leave you alone again. The coyotes? They won't bother you. People can be scared of them, but personally I like listening to them at night. Just one time I had this scary situation with a mountain lion. It was just before sunset and I was coming back from a hike when all of a sudden it was just there, in front of me, on the trail. What you're supposed to do is make noise and make yourself look big and tough and slowly back away. Somehow I managed to remember those three things even though I was really freaked out. The thing stared at me for a good long time too, but then it just made this kind of snuffling noise and turned away like I wasn't worth bothering with. All that to say, I'm no stranger to the comings and goings of the resident creatures. We managed to coexist out there just fine. So again, after I finished my degree, I was hired to work at the old Moffat Tunnel. It's a railroad and water tunnel that cuts through the Continental Divide in north-central Colorado. So it's pretty high up there, almost 10,000 feet above sea level. It was given a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark designation, too. So I was honored to have the chance to work on it. I got an 18-month contract to work on the restoration. I stayed up there in an old cabin. Everybody else preferred to go back down to town at the end of the day. So I was alone a lot at night. It was great, though. Working hard during the day and having peace and quiet and starry skies at night. It's not for everybody, but I loved it. On weekends, though, a lot of times crazy kids would come up there to party. The tunnel was some kind of a magnet for them, I guess. The thing is 24 feet high, 18 feet wide, and 6 miles long. You can imagine the daredevil crap that they would get into. During the day, there are 15 trains that go through there. After I'd been up there for about four or five months, these carcasses started showing up near the tunnel entrance. First, I was like, are these things getting hit by trains? But when I got a closer look, they obviously had been eaten with just remnants left behind. There got to be way too many of them to just be typical wild animal kills. I kept removing the piles of fur and bone and burying them as well as I could. I never saw any bears or even another mountain lion after that first one. But back to the college kids and how popular it was for them to come by and party up there. I guess it gave them a real charge to watch the train speed by. I was worried that one of them was going to go too far and do something stupid. I sure wasn't prepared as a medic for foolish teenagers. They would come in the late afternoon, and then they would traipse through the woods acting like they were Robin Hood and his merry men. They definitely did not know what they're doing. And I'm not kidding you, that was their deal. When it got dark enough, they would come close to the tunnel and wait. Apparently, the lights and sounds from the trains would really send them to another dimension. They would be gasping and laughing and howling and dancing for hours. I don't know how you manage that much emotion for so long, but they sure did. One night, I tucked myself into bed in the cabin. It was midnight, and I could hear them out there, rioting around. But I was almost asleep. But then I heard screaming. At first, I thought it was part of all the craziness, but no, this was a blood-curdling scream. 
Somebody was scared. I jumped out of bed and into my pants and I ran out there. They were all screaming, running in different directions. It was so dark that I couldn't see why, but I smelled something powerful, skunky. You know what I'm thinking. But at the same time, I had never seen those guys smoking. But then I could hear a train coming through the tunnel towards us. And when the light came through, I saw the outline of this huge, hairy beast. It was incredible, like 12 feet tall. I mean, the tunnel's 24 feet tall. And this thing reached halfway up of it, easily. It was growling loudly, too, and it obviously was enraged by that crowd of kids. At this point, they were scattered everywhere, and I assumed that they all had made it back to their cars. The train then roared by and blocked off the sight of the beast. I ran back to the cabin, and I locked myself in and was shaking in my boots. No way could something be that big. Have you heard of something like that out here in Colorado? It was like a Bigfoot or something. I thought they lived in Oregon or somewhere else. Do any of you know? I've been thinking, did this thing ride a train from out west? Okay, maybe I've been spending too much time alone, but my mind is really trying to figure this out. After that, I started going back to town to sleep at night with the other workers. After a few nights of silence after that, it got to be too much for me, too. Small towns come with their own dirty little secrets. And my hometown is no different. It's located about 30 minutes south of Oklahoma City. A tiny, blink-and-you'll-miss-it type of town. Slaughterville is literally a convenience store, a few housing additions, and like four intersections but it's home to crazy, insane stories like the one I'm about to tell you. No one ever wants to really talk about this to outside people. We get tired of getting laughed at and made fun of, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Believe me, if you want, but at least hear me out. It was back in 2015. I had just moved back and was staying with my aunt and her family while I looked for my own place. I wasn't thrilled with staying in Slaughterville, but beggars can't be choosers, or whatever the saying is. I enjoyed being outside during the day. It was always fun to watch the kids on dirt bikes and four-wheelers race up and down the red dirt road. But after dark, that's a whole other monster, and one that I didn't enjoy. We spent most of our time hanging out on the porch, laughing at the shenanigans, and watching the kids play. But once the sun started to set, we all headed back inside and hid out. We avoided the outside as much as we could after dark. On this night in particular, my boyfriend drove down to see me. I asked him to be there before dark, but his work held him up. I wasn't overly comfortable with hanging out in the car after dark, but I went ahead and I gave in. We had been outside for about 45 minutes when I could feel the energy around us change. The air got thick, and it felt electric. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat, and I was getting really anxious. Of course, he just kept talking. He had no idea what kind of weird things happened out here, especially after dark. I kept looking around the car as he chatted. I was trying to follow along, but honestly, I was distracted, really anxious. Something was off. And then I watched in horror as a young woman appeared in front of the car. She was gorgeous and wore an old hospital gown. She looked completely normal except for the fact that she was glowing faintly. I gasped and I pointed ahead of us out the window. My boyfriend covered his mouth and watched as this girl started floating closer to the car until she was right in front of the bumper. We both just watched silently as she raised her arm and then reached behind her head. I screamed when she pulled a giant knife from her back. It was stained red. I looked at my boyfriend in the next seat and grabbed his hand. I knew that nothing was going to happen to us, but I was terrified. He just kept his eyes glued to the spot in front of us. I turned back around and watched as the girl looked at us and started crying. She was begging for our help. My boyfriend started to open the door to get out, but I grabbed it and I yanked it shut. We could not get out and interact with whatever this was. 
I was sure it was trying to trick us. And then as the girl realized that we were not going to help, she got angry and the tears stopped. She then pointed the knife at us and started screaming. But the screams were all wrong. They came in waves. I had to let go of the door to cover my ears. We just stayed in the car, listening to this girl scream at us until she simply vanished. One second, she was there. The next, she was gone. My boyfriend looked at me with his eyes wide, panicked. I reached out and then I pulled him in to hug him. I was shaking and freaked out and even though I knew what had happened out there, I couldn't imagine how he was feeling. We then both decided that maybe it was time to wrap up his visit and for him to just head back to the city. We said our goodbyes and I made sure to let him know not to stop for any hitchhikers on the way out of town. Don't even stop if you see somebody walking on the road. Just drive by, I said. Picking up hitchhikers is not safe in general, and it's definitely not safe here. He agreed and headed home. But it was only five minutes before I got a frantic call. He was clearly panicking as he told me that at the stop sign there was an older woman in a gown walking towards his car. I told him to lock his doors and not to look at her, just drive. I stayed on the phone with him trying to calm him down. Once he turned out of the neighborhood and back onto the road to the highway, he noticed this black shadow following him. I just let him know to keep driving, but my blood ran cold. I could hear the fear in his voice as he told me that whatever it was that was behind him was keeping up, even as he sped back to the highway. I promised to stay on the phone even as he went in and out of service, making sure that I kept my voice calm. I know the creatures that live out here, but this figure didn't make sense even to me. And even as he described it to me, I tried to keep myself as calm as I could. It was a black shadow with no eyes. It appeared in the shape of a tall man, seven to eight feet tall and fast. He was doing easily 80 and this thing was constantly in the rearview mirror. It followed him until he hit Norman city limits when it growled low and deep and suddenly disappeared. Only then did he feel safe enough to hang up. We still don't know exactly what followed him, but he isn't the only one to experience being followed. I have so many more stories I could tell you, but we'll just leave it with this one for now. I have always had a passion for literature. As a child, I spent my summers reading and writing stories about magic, mythical creatures, and fantasy. I wrote stories about monsters, some old and some new, and I recited them proudly in front of my parents. I ran the school's paper in high school, and two of my stories were even published by the time I graduated. At this point, it's safe to assume I wasn't exactly popular, but that never got to me. I was much happier living vicariously through the worlds I created on paper than engaging in American youth culture. College was when I finally got to see both edges of the sword. While I felt confident in my studies and my ability to manifest the career I wanted, I realized that I was incredibly naive when it came to dating, friendships, and basically every aspect of social life. So when I started dating Sam, I wasn't nearly as prepared as I thought I would be. I figured that real life and fiction couldn't really be all that different, and I had read and written hundreds of stories involving romance. I thought I would at least have a chance. Sam was unlike any character I'd ever encountered. Sam was even a bigger dork than I was, but that's one of the things that I loved about him. That he was an expert on early European folklore, and we were both planning to get our master's degrees. But Sam didn't like to share his original work with me. I begged and pleaded so many times to just read a page, but he declined every time. I didn't want to push it. As a writer myself, I knew how scary the process could be. But I was Sam's partner, and I always shared my writing with him, so it started to make me a little uncomfortable. But it's not like bringing that up to Sam was an easy task. No, this conversation almost always ended in an argument. Sam was a year ahead of me in school and graduation was approaching. There was a giant final project coming up for him, and he'd been typing away furiously for most of the semester. I noticed that as the writing process progressed, Sam withdrew. 
We had never had a problem with intimacy or anything like that in our past, but something had definitely changed. One night, about a month before graduation, I tried to fix the problem. I prepared a lovely dinner and made the apartment and myself look nice. I missed Sam and I wanted him to want me, but he basically disregarded everything as soon as he got home. There was too much writing to be done. I was a distraction. I couldn't believe it. I flipped out and I demanded to see what he was working on. He made it clear that he didn't have time to fight with me that night. He was going to write at the library. So he grabbed his laptop and rushed out the door. I was speechless. If it was space that he wanted, how much more could I give? But Sam was so defensive every time I tried to bring things up, it made me wonder if all the trouble had been worth it. So I finished my glass of wine, threw on my coat, and headed for the library. I needed him to know I was serious. I did wish that our place off campus was closer to the library, though. It was still pretty cold that time of year in Connecticut, especially at night, and the seclusion of campus didn't really help. As a scary story connoisseur, I wasn't too phased by the whole dark, stormy night cliché, but I knew a chill when I felt one. I checked my watch and I realized it was just after midnight. Great. Sam was such a pain, I thought. The library was a pretty isolated, standalone building at the far end of campus, and since Sam was probably the only one inside, the warm glow of the ceiling lights felt dimmer. It was quiet when I stepped inside and the chill never left me. I could see a dozen empty tables and the characteristic walls of shelved books, but no Sam. I decided to look for him in the aisles. I went to the section with early age folklore where I knew he pulled most of his research. And when I turned into the aisle, I stopped. That stretch of floor was littered with crumpled balls of paper, some torn or stained with this translucent brown substance. And then there were the poor hardbacks from which the pages had been torn. They were tossed aside like garbage by whoever had done this. But the most peculiar thing was that the balled up pages were completely blank. I was puzzled. I walked down the aisle, stooped to pick up random wads to confirm my findings. It was so sad to see the destruction of these books. And then at the end of the row, I saw the papers trailing into the next aisle over. I followed. And when I turned the corner, I gasped. There was Sam, hunched over a half-destroyed hardback with an engraved cryptid on the front. I watched in horror as he greedily stuffed the handful of paper into his mouth, chewed it, and then threw the wet, wordless page down. His lips were ringed with black ink and saliva, and his expression was that of an alcoholic working behind a bar. He was simply devouring the pages, sucking the words out of them and decimating the place of origin. I was appalled at every aspect of what was happening before me. Sam? I said his name sternly and he snapped his focus at me. For a second I was afraid, but then it washed away. I suddenly knew that Sam was a fraud. He hissed at me and I guess it should have been more frightening than I felt, but I was not afraid of him for some reason. I felt pity for anything. I felt that he was pathetic, and then he scurried away from my sight, and that was the last I saw of him. In a lot of ways, I know Sam wasted my time, but there's a bigger part of me that's appreciative of how badly things ended. I think I needed to see him in the act to finally come to terms with how things were failing. Sam showed me the ugly truth about love, one that I could never accept through the writings of another person, and in that, Sam taught me that sometimes life is stranger than fiction.